like she takes more from the friendship than she gives. I can't get a female point of view on something from my male friends. I did feel betrayed. She, she had no right to do that. I didn't give her permission to do that. And I figured, well, maybe I can just drop her and she won't notice or whatever. I tell him more than I, I tell my parents. I'm sure that they... thing about friendship is being absolutely honest. and when Charlie came and she cared about what I thought and how I felt. I've never really found someone as open as her and lighthearted. I mean, he, he knows what to take serious. I really wanted that friend and I never found her until the summer, actually. I found a friend that she's perfect. <laughs> I think we know just about pretty much about everything. I don't, and I don't, I don't feel, I wouldn't feel any restraint and, you know, something happened that I couldn't tell him. Yeah, we. I, I tell him more than I, I tell my parents. I felt like a failure once when I had a really good friend, and um, a lot of people didn't really like her, and so they were always talking bad about her to me. So, you know, I figured, well, maybe I could just drop her and she won't notice or whatever. So, um, I did that, and uh, it really hurt her, and so uh, I started really feeling low about myself. You know, the, what kind of friend am I? You know. So, um, things just got worse and worse as they progressed, and I felt bad about it ever since. I can think of one girl that kind of wanted to be my friend, you know, and I didn't really like her very well, and so I kind of ignored her. At first, when I got rid of the person, I'd feel kind of good because, oh, they're out of my way, they're out of my life, good, I don't like them, but then I'd sort of think, um, you know, how I felt when people did that to me, and then I felt bad. Since she's my best friend, you can't hang around this girl over here. Because if you want to be my friend, then you can't be her friend. That happened to me once. Best friends is a title. And um, it's hard to break away from that once you have that title. But you can't just give it up. I'd like to still stay, you know, best friends with this person. And that's what people get caught up is with the B word. <laughs> best. <laughs> it's like a, a link.
of the hardest things we ever had was... The Beth thing. The Beth thing, yeah. I was going out with Beth for a little while, and she started acting really strange, and they were really close, and they started not being so close anymore, get, not liking each other. Well, I still like her, and she mm -hmm. still likes me, but I don't know what's wrong. And we're just friends. Great. Beth and her. Seems like that's happening. Yeah. <laughs> we just didn't know each other. So I think that was kind of on our minds, and we got in this rather large argument about it. <laughs> it was fun. Yeah, it's because I said, look, I'm sorry, and he didn't believe me. And he stopped in the car in the middle of the street. And saying, you believe me, and I said, let's get out of the car. <laughs> <laughs> so we almost got out of the car and fought it out, but, but then we realized that we were both extremely serious. And being stupid. So. Yeah, so <laughs> and we realized this is pointless. Yeah. We're friends, and we shouldn't ruin it over something extremely dumb. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah, it was. That was fun. Never seen a car skid uphill, but. It's a burp. Yeah. My life, my father pushed me and tried to get me to, to be my best, but he pushed in a way that it hurt me on the inside. When he raised my brother and sister, much older, he was an alcoholic, and they just kind of stayed away from him. They had no relationship with him at all. It's really odd because it's like he set himself as old self aside and now he talks to me more as a friend than a controlling father. Well, one of these people that I trust so much is my mom and a big friend. Every time that I've had a real hard time at school I come home and I cry and I let it all out and she's always just okay <laughs> and she'll tell me um, she's a, she's there to tell me what I've been doing wrong, what I have um, done to deserve that, or whatever, um, and I won't take it from her. There are a lot of people I won't take that from. <laughs> the person that I call my best friend, sometimes is who, for me, it is very hard for me to maintain that friendship simply because I feel like she takes more from the friendship than she gives. She doesn't exactly know. California and I had a lot of guy friends but mostly girlfriends and I came here and was just looking for any friends and then I found Brian and I guess I'd never had a really really close guy friend. In the beginning it was hard for me to talk to Brian about other guys um, shyness or buying into the relationship uh, question or whatever it was just hard for me to open up with him about my relationships with other people, the male persuasion, or, or how I felt. Um, when I'm talking with my male friends, um, there are certain topics that you just don't broach. Um, like, 
I've never had an honest conversation about sex with any of my male friends. Um, it just always um, declines into a big joke fest, and um, you know that it's not cool. You know that's that's I don't you know enjoy that a whole lot. Um, also, I just think I can't I can't get a female point of view on something from my male friends. The term "just friends" is an interesting term. Um, it's one that I guess I use just to quiet people who are hounding me about about my relationship with Brian and I'm just go, we're just friends, go away. But um, friends are too important to be just. You know, we hang out a lot and stuff like that, but we also share a lot um, of ourselves with each other and um, to do that, you need, you need to be more than, than just friends. I had a friend who told me that he was gay. He said he did not want anybody to know. I mean, obviously, if you're friends with him, you know those people know. And um, I did tell somebody. Think, and my thought pattern was this, and this isn't a justification in any way. My thought pattern was she doesn't know him. She'll never meet him or anything. But I still feel really convicted. And they don't. They don't know each other or anything. But I still feel really bad that, you know, it's like the whole situation of, well, I'll tell you, but don't tell someone so I told you. And then you go and tell someone, but don't tell anybody I told you. And I think that's just really cheap. And if, if someone was to, if he was to come to me today and said, you know, Jen, I told you not to tell anybody, I would, I don't know how I would, how I would react because that would just, I would just feel really cheap. The friends that I've had in the past have, have not been too good of friends, um, according to keeping my feelings, you know, that they know about to themselves, and that really hurts, that really hurts me, and um, it's hard for me to trust again. People would say, well, you hang out together all the time, and you start to perform, it doesn't mean you're going out, and they would say, I don't think so, and there, there's some confusion. It's confused us, but I think it's confused. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Questions like that would would come up, and um, also just you know when we would work together, people would ask, "What's the deal with you?" Okay, we're friends. Right, friends. There have been moments when yes, I would have thought that it would be a lot nicer to have a relationship other than what we had, but throughout all those times, I would just remember uh, what our friendship means to me. I didn't want to push it. You know? I didn't want to to have something really great, or maybe even not so great, nothing greater than our relationship, and um, then all of a sudden have a drop off and nothing. Most of my friends, when they end up dating someone, if they break up, the friendship is gone. The friendship with him is more important to me. The risk of being friends.
who's a brother and a confidant. We hang out with a lot of non-Christians, and it's also nice when we're with those friends. I don't feel alone. I don't feel like I'm the only person facing them. He can back me up, and I can back him up. And P.E., all the other people run faster, you know. I feel pr pressured if I come behind, like in running something, I feel pressure and trying to, you know, catch up with everybody. If they don't like me the way I'm at. I think friendship is a great thing. I don't think too many people would make it without without a good solid friendship. Thank you. 
playing with their dads, playing ball and stuff. I didn't have that. And it, it hurt me a lot inside. The men at my church were helping me out, but it didn't help much because I was, like, really sad and stuff. And uh, I was, like, every, every once in a while I was just getting these depressions, and everyone would know it, but I'd try to hide it, and it wouldn't work or anything. And finally I asked God just to help me get rid of this pain because I just had this throbbing pain in my heart and uh, my uh, assistant pastor took me out one night because he doesn't have a dad either because his dad died when he was like 14 so he kind of knew what it felt like and so he took me out and talked to me and that night we prayed about it it helped a lot but I still had a lot of ache in my heart and uh, it took me like a couple months to actually deal with it and now it's I, I mean, I don't really care now because I, I used to want to be there at my races and stuff because I see all these other people's dads and stuff just totally like, go, go, son. And for me, I, all, I, all I had then was my mom, which is great because she's really supportive, but at that time in my life, I needed a dad. <laughs>
I, I have always thrived on people liking me, on, on being accepted. And I, it's not that I would sell myself out to be accepted, but I would just become, uh, I would do so well at whatever it was I was doing. If I was in high school and, and wanted to be uh, liked by people, but knew that first and foremost I, I was committed to being a Christian, well, I, I was committed to finding ways to being a Christian and yet doing that in a way that really, you know, didn't alienate me from people. I, I guess by the time I graduated from high school, I pretty much figured that I had most most of the Christian life figured out. You know, I had it pretty much pretty packaged in a, in a neat little box. So I guess I, in a lot of ways I was kind of considered a goody-two-shoes guy. I didn't go through a real rebellious time. You know, if, if my dad knew I was having a hard time, with something, or he sensed that, he'd sit down and say, son, you know, what's bugging you out here? You know, did you get a girl pregnant or something? You know? And, you know, dad had this great way of, like, going to the total extreme. So I'd, I'd like, you know, immediately open up, oh, no, dad, no, no way. It's like, you know, I'm just struggling. You know, I got a D, you know, on a report. Oh, man, I said it. You know, it's like he had this great way of kind of bringing it out of you and going to the way to the extreme. So it really wasn't until I guess I got a little farther on life, got out uh, uh, in, in life, and got married, and my wife and I, uh, seven months after we were married, uh, found out we had a baby on the way, um, and I was, I guess I was 21 at the time, our first year of marriage, and there were holes in the, in the walls uh, in our first apartment. We, needless to say, we moved out of our apartment. We didn't get our deposit back because we left a few a uh, few battle wounds in that apartment from from some really uh, hard hard struggles had our first child five weeks after she was born we came back to our apartment and it had been destroyed by fire and uh, I would honestly have to say that was when the rug started getting pulled out from under uh, this guy I would go to church and, and sit in church and just cry. I just sat there the whole time the pastor was preaching and the invitation and and I just I would just sit there and cry and I didn't know why. I didn't have any answers. I didn't walk away going, Well, I feel better now. You know, I just I just felt I felt uh, very confused and all my life Satan is the author of confusion, therefore I will not confess confusion. You know, I cannot be confused because if I'm confused, that means I'm not spiritual. Um, and I decided, um, no, God, I'm confused, you know, and I'm, I'm afraid. And I know fear is, you know, not you've not given me a spirit of fear, but I'm afraid. And I'm all of these things I'm not supposed to be, God. Uh, so will Jesus, will you come and be all these things that I have? the prayer immediately was, God, you know, I know my mom and dad, I know, and, and they even said all along the way, we're not going anywhere, you know, we're not getting a divorce, we're not going to do anything rash, we're just going to, we just got to work through some, some problems here. And um, it began to, to get clear and clear that that was a lot of lip service and, and uh, saying, repeating the same things that we'd heard them say for many years, but some things started to really surface and uh, they got a divorce and that was the rug got pulled out again, probably even in a greater way, because by this time I'd already set myself up to just say, hey, my mom and dad have the perfect relationship, uh, you know, if, uh, well, let's just, let's do what they did, you know, my wife and I. And I recognized 
real early on that uh, that I was I was very much the kind of guy that that uh, said, "Hey, we've got a problem. Let's sit down and talk about it." My family, I mean, if we have to scream in it, about it, let's talk about it. My wife came from an environment where if you got a problem, you clam up and, and it'll go away eventually. And uh, so I'm screaming at her, and she's you know batting her eyes and getting more and more uh, afraid to talk to me about it. And, uh, and, of course, I'm screaming lots of really good spiritual things, you know, <laughs> of course. You know, they're scriptural things and, you know, very spiritual. But uh, it, ain't, it ain't what needs to be happening. I began to realize that that uh, the problem was not in Mary Beth and in her inability to communicate with me and all of these things. The problem was was within me and my my desire to to please people uh, more than my desire to die to self, to to let myself be denied and and find out what it meant to to. Uh, love someone to the point that I'd laid my life down for him. I wrote a song for my wife. It's on my new album called Go There With You. And uh, I think that song has expressed uh, my desire to to pursue her and to be to be ready to go into to whatever dark unknown valley that we've got to go through again. right now and you know and I mean there have been more than one occasion that we've sat down really just as short as a few months ago with tears in our eyes and with big dark clouds of doubt hanging over us saying okay is it time to quit this and go you know get a job at a factory somewhere and, and do a nine to five job so you know here's where I'm going here's when I'm coming home and kind of an advisory board of some people around me that I go and, and they love me enough to, enough to let me be real honest with them. I sat down with them less than a year ago and I went in and I, I said, well, I feel like today I just need to sit down and cry for a while with you guys and kind of laughed it off and went on and we went into our meeting and, and one of these, these precious brothers and friends of mine said, now let's go back to what you said earlier. Let's not just laugh that off. You said you needed to maybe just sit down and cry with us. Why, why'd you say that? And uh, I said, because I'm a failure. I said, I'm a failure as a father. I'm a failure as a husband. Uh, I'm a failure as a Christian. I just feel like in every area of my life, I, uh, I feel like I'm a failure. And one, one of my, my friends, pastors, said, you know, see, as far as God's concerned, you can't be a failure. Did you realize that? You know, and uh, boy, the tears came, you know. And it's, it's just almost too good to believe that there is one who loves us unconditionally. And then to, when we can grasp a hold of that, when I get a hold of a little glimpse of that, then I can turn to my wife and I can say, I love you. And, and I can mean it with a depth that, you know, 
goes beyond words. And I can look at my children and say, I love you guys. And, and I can hear my wife say, I love you. And that can mean something that it's never meant to me before, you know. But I understand it in, in light of God's mercy and God's grace. I wrote an album about grace. I wrote this album, The Great Adventure, that, that talks about God's grace because for me, that is what made, that's what has made my life uh, become uh, an adventure again. And an adventure is not free of surprises and free of pain. Any adventure is, you know, people lose their lives in adventures. supposed to mean? I know. I know you know. The question is, what are you going to do about it? Look, do you think you can just duck out the back door when things get... I, I said I know, all right? It was stupid. I am an idiot. What's going on? I mean, Marta trusts you, Trevor. And Jermaine Peters. I said I know. What do you want from me? Give me the stereo. I'd say you better come clean. How can I come clean? Just kill me. There's that possibility, which is why we should take care of the stereo before you come clean. But 
think about it, man. She knows. She knows, and if you try to talk your way out of this, you'll be worse than an idiot, man. You'll be a, a lying, sneaking snake in the grass. No, you know what you'll be? <laughs> you'll be a single-celled bacterium. You'll be so sad. I missed a biology test, didn't I? Sir, you did. Trav, that doesn't matter now. You'll be dead soon. Uh, enough with the dead stuff. I, I need you to help me. Too late. Here she comes. I just pick up that stereo on my way home. Hey, buddy. See ya. Now. I, I don't know. This isn't what I was expecting. I, I thought you'd try to get out of it. But you didn't. So, if you want to keep trying, we could do that if that's what you want. It's, ex it's exactly what I want. <laughs> Omar thought you'd kill me. I thought, I thought this was the end. I thought you'd kill me. I didn't want to think. And then I, well, what an idiot. What? 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 Well, if, if we're going to start out fresh, there's something I have to tell you. I am. Um, I, I understand about last night because I felt the same way. What? What do you mean? Trevor and I, I... About about two months ago, I, I went out with Kyle Waters when he was home from school. And I felt just like you do. I felt weird and uncomfortable and... And I made him take me home. I don't know what to say. You felt it. trapped. I, I felt trapped and, and uncomfortable. And well, Kyle's parents came over for dinner, and well, Kyle came over, and well, we we went out, and then he called me the next day and asked me out again, and I didn't really. Think wait, 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 wait! Just a chicken plug a minute. You went out twice. Well, technically, yeah, I, I suppose. But after what happened the first night, I. It just felt too weird, and I, I made him take me home a second ago. Oh, help us. Something happened the first night? What? What happened? What happened? Do you know what I'm trying to tell you? What happened? He, uh, he kissed me. He kissed? He kissed you? How could he kiss you? How could you let him kiss you, Marta? Kevin, I don't think you want that sort of detail. I don't want to give that sort of detail. No, no. Detail is exactly what I want. I want to save her every precious moment. Let's pretend this is a sleepover. Why don't you pretend that I'm one of your friends? What did you tell them? What exactly? Oh, am I the last one to know? Nothing, Trevin. I haven't told anybody anything until right now. I told you I was ashamed, Trevin. I'm trying to make this right. It's going to take a way of a lot more than feeling bad, Marta. I'm... Stunned. I trust it. I don't know what to say, Marta. I think you said plenty, Trevin. More than enough. In fact, way too much. <laughs> no, don't even. Just don't. 